This isn't the best idea I've ever had. As some of you may know if you follow me on Instagram, I spent a large part of last autumn photographing fungi I found around forests and trees in places just like this. And, um, you know, the, the, the seemingly regular patches of grass where I'd walk Kyra, there'd be little fungi popping up and I got really, really interested in it and really kind of invested and I started taking pictures and I started reading more and researching and I just absolutely fell in love with the world of fungi. I guess kind of mostly specifically mushrooms, but I fell in love with their colours and their shapes and their kind of earthly smell and their almost alien nature and the way you always feel really curious around them but at the same time fearful as well. You know, I've always been told my, my entire life and I'm sure a lot of you have as well, you know, you, you never touch fungi that you find, you never eat them, you never go near them because you never know how dangerous they might be. I mean, even when I was like posting photos on Instagram of the fungus I'd taken pictures of, people were like, oh, I hope you didn't eat it. And it's like this ingrained fear in all of us, you know? Even when you think you know a mushroom or fungi, identification can be difficult. You never really 100% know which are the dangerous ones, at least when you're an amateur. And um, I guess in that respect they're kind of a lot like people, or, or just animals, or plants, or like, they're, 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 they're just like living things, like any other living thing on the planet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course not all of them are dangerous, but there is a lot of trickery out there. You know, think about mushrooms that look like twins but are wildly different species and one can kill you and one can cure you. It's easy to see why Lewis Carroll chose the mushroom as the tool to help Alice change her size in Alice in Wonderland. As the caterpillar warns her, one side will make you grow taller and the other side will make you grow shorter. But as Alice starts to kind of examine the big mushroom and she walks around it and she looks at it from different sides, she realises that it all begins to look the same. She doesn't know which side is which. She doesn't even know where one side starts and the other ends, never mind which will make her grow and which will make her shrink. So she has to take a risk. It's much like amateurs when we approach mushrooms and we can try and make an educated guess and we can think, well, this is probably this mushroom or this might be this but we don't really know for sure. Only Alice was trying to determine one side of a mushroom from another, we're trying to determine one species from another. All this said, my interest isn't in eating mushrooms or touching them, I, I'm not really a fan of mushrooms at all. Although, I have, on my little mushroom discovery journey, kind of realised that I think most of the mushrooms that I dislike are all one species, so I might actually quite like some of the others and I think I do want to kind of start branching out and maybe trying some different ones, but that said, I'm not going to be going out and foraging for mushrooms anytime soon. What my interest is in is observing them, seeing them, looking at them, understanding what they are and how they work and uncovering all their little secrets and of course making a little bit of art in the process. I've recently just read The Secret Life of Fungi by um, I think it's Aaliyah Whiteley or Aaliyah Whiteley. It's probably my favourite book that I've read this year so far and it's this beautiful little introduction to the topic written by someone who's clearly so passionate and emotionally invested in the world of fungi. It's an absolute pleasure to read. It's enthralling and it covers like a range of topics like what fungi actually are, how they reproduce, where they grow, how they interact with other organisms, why they're so important, and also kind of more slightly philosophical topics like why they intrigue us so much. She also touches on the influences that fungi have had throughout history, including references in art and poetry and literature, which I was quite interested in. It is a fantastic little book, but if you're looking for something a little more technical and science-based, I am thoroughly enjoying um, Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake at the minute. I've not finished it yet, but thoroughly recommend so far. So if you've been following my content for a while, you might have noticed that I kind of go through these stages in my life where I get very I guess like interested in a certain topic or very enthusiastic about them or I, I, don't, I don't really know what you call it, um, I know how to describe it. I don't really know many other people who do this but I, I kind of, I latch onto a topic and I, I need to know everything about it and I want to learn everything about it and I get very very passionate, very enthusiastic and in the past you may have seen me do this with octopuses or poetry or any other kind of thing and these, these kind of like interests or passions, they, they last a while, um, but it's always very intense for at least a few months at a time and then they kind of pop back up later and it recurs and it's a, it's a thing in my life. But this is a new one at the minute, the whole fun, fungi one, and I'm enjoying it and it's good. So I've been, I've been reading a lot about fungi, I've been learning a lot, I've been 
uh, very, very invested and interested. And another part of what I like to do is I like to create a lot of art around whatever my interest is. So a lot of you guys have seen me do like painting streams with octopuses in the past, or you've seen my octopus paintings or art or sketches or anything. And, and at the minute it's fungi. So I've been creating loads of art based around mostly mushrooms um, at this point, because I'm finding them the most fun to draw and paint. And I've been getting really, really into it and really enjoying it. And I started dabbling a little bit in writing my own poetry as well. Um, but I've also just been out exploring other people's poetry around mushrooms and kind of unsurprisingly it's quite limited. Apparently it doesn't inspire other people like it does me, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> I will be a mushroom poetry pioneer, which now I say that out loud does not sound half as cool as it did in my head. Fungi are actually a kingdom in the same way that plants or animals are a kingdom. There's that many of them. It's not just mushrooms, for example. There's so much more. And fungi as a kingdom are so intricately linked to all of the life on Earth. It's kind of a little bit unbelievable. I find it fascinating. In The Secret Life of Fungi, uh, there's a beautiful little description of fungi here that reads, Fungi are organisms that digest animal and plant material through a process called os osmotroph... Osm Osmotrophy. Osmotrophy. That could work. We'll go with that one. <laughs> Invading the material and sending out enzymes to break down substances into sugars, fatty acids, amino acids, and so on. The cell walls of fungi are made of glucans and chitin. Glucans can be found in plants, and chitin is a hard, semi-transparent material otherwise found in the exoskeleton of insects, crustaceans, and spiders. But only fungi combine them. Many types of fungi produce spores, and they can be produced sexually or asexually. They are more closely related to animals than plants, which is a fact that I found a little bit mind-blowing at first. Because you look at them and you think plants, right? But I don't know. When you start to understand how they work and the kind of chemical and electrical reactions that happen in them, you can kind of see why they are more closely related to animals. If we go way back in time to when plants were still very new and very tiny and we didn't have these giant trees and other planty things that we have today. It's thought that these giant groups of fungi essentially ruled the dry land for around 40 million years, which is a crazy long time. And it's important to remember when we talk about fungi, we're not just talking about mushrooms and the little, little mushy boys we see today, but you can have whole underground networks of fungi. Under our feet right now, a whole network of fungi working together and communicating together. And it's kind of fascinating. And like I say, it's not just mushrooms. We're talking about yeasts and mold um, even lichens, lots of different things make up fungi and it's all around us all the time. Even now as I'm talking, I'm probably breathing in fungi spores as we speak. All that said, mushrooms are easily the most recognisable of fungi, even if there are so many types. Now despite there not really being all that many poems about mushrooms out there, I did find a few. One of them is um, about the morel mushroom by Jane Whitledge. Softly, they come thumbing up from firm ground, protruding unharmed, easily crumbled, and yet, how they shouldered the leaf and mould aside, rising, unperturbed, breathing obscurely, still as stone. By the slumping log, by the dappled aspen, they grow alone. A dumb eloquence seems their trade, like hooded monks in a sacred wood, they say, tomorrow we are gone beautiful little poem and there's so much we could talk about in this but it's just kind of interesting to me how often mushrooms are referred to as monks in poetry. I mean Jane is absolutely not the only person to do this. Laura Kaczynski also opens her poem just simply titled Mushrooms in the same way. Like silent naked monks huddled around an old tree stump having spun themselves in the night out of thought and nothingness and God so pleased with their silence he grants them teeth and tongues like us. How long have you been gone? a child's hot tears on my bare arms. Why is it we make these comparisons between mushrooms and monks? Do we find them quiet, mysterious, stoic, holy? Do we see little clusters of mushrooms and immediately think of little brotherhoods and vows and commitments and sacrifice? Or is it meant more as an aesthetic similarities with their little bald heads shining in the sunlight? Whatever it is, I find it an interesting little comparison and it's something that I've kind of been thinking about a lot. I've been trying to kind of capture the essence of mushrooms in a lot of the art I've been making recently, the paintings and the drawings and the prints. Um, I've been trying to recreate various types of mushroom 
Uh, some more traditional, others a little crazier, like the pink oyster mushroom with its thin pink caps and these bright pink curls like wound round each other, its gills facing outwards kind of showing themselves off to the world. But it's not just the physical appearance of mushrooms I try to capture. I find their way of reproduction and using spores is absolutely fascinating and I try to capture that in a lot of these paintings by adding in these many kind of obviously oversized spores floating around and being carried away by the winds. Spores are single cells which are often described as the blueprint of reproduction for fungi. And fungi have lots of different ways of releasing these spores out into the wild so they can go forth and create more fungusness. Fun fungus. Fungusness. <laughs> Sometimes these little spores will be released in like a little poof of a cloud burst. Sometimes they'll just be dropped from the gills silently and steadily. And other times there'll be a build up of pressure inside the mushroom before they explode and burst from the top of it, spurting out everywhere. And when you get the exploding spores like this, the force with which they fly out is insane. The, the kind of like the force, the pressure, the speed has been compared to bullets, it's been compared to space shuttles, like, you know, same level of force. It's, uh, it's pretty full on. Kind of impressive for little things. As we're told in The Secret Life of Fungi, some species discharge spores explosively, which accelerate 10,000 times faster than a space shuttle directly after launch, reaching speeds up to 100 kilometers per hour. Some of the quickest movements achieved by any living organism. Other species of fungi create their own microclimates. Spores are carried upwards by a gust of wind generated by the mushrooms as water evaporates from their gills. It's incredible. But when you think about their origins and where they came from and how early on they evolved and developed and what the world was like at the time, it makes sense that they would have to create their own little microclimates because they weren't really working with everything else. Later, everything else came along and worked with the fungi. It's absolutely fascinating and it's magical and sometimes it's beautiful and sometimes it's a little bit shocking and sometimes it's even a little bit horrifying. I think probably the most horrifying example comes in the form of Ophiocordyceps unilateralis as just one example. This is a fungi which is like something out of a horror film, I swear. The spores of these little guys often find themselves settling on the bodies of carpenter ants and from there they make their way into the bloodstream of the ants where they start to multiply. The fungal cells grow specifically between the muscle cells of the ant and essentially start to control the ant. They never touch the ant's brain, they never directly control the nervous system. It literally just takes control of the muscles and makes the ant do its bidding. You know like when you're a kid and your older brother like grabs your own arm and starts making you hit yourself with it while like giggling and being like, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. That's basically what this fungus is doing to the ant. It's literally just grabbing hold of its muscles and saying, okay, now we go here and here and here. As it takes control, the fungus literally stops the ant from st serving the rest of the colony and makes him climb. And he climbs to this very specific height to find the right humidity and the right temperature for the fungus to really, really grow. And as it does, the fungus causes the ant to bite down on a leaf, any particular leaf, and not let go. It basically locks the jaw in place so it's stuck there, rooting him to the spot high above the rest of his colony. And then this long fungal stalk erupts from the ant's head, killing it and releasing tons of spores into the world around him, which subsequently fall on the rest of the ant colony below and infect new bodies. And so the cycle continues. It's absolutely insane and a little bit terrifying. And when you hear stories like this, the creatures in games like The Last of Us don't feel so impossible after all, do they? And I think that's what makes it all the more scary. It's grim and it's terrifying and it really hammers home the dangers of fungi. And we don't just have to worry about eating a bad mushroom here or there. Uh, we have fungi that can essentially control other living things. The falls of fungi can cause bad allergic reactions. We can get fungal infections. There's so many dangers, but for all the fungi that can kill us, there's also plenty that can cure us and plenty that do help us. And the world would not function without fungi. Take penicillin, for example, which revolutionized modern medicine. This comes, from the penic this comes from the penicillium fungi, of which there's more than 300 different species in the world. We also have helpful fungi that can aid in decay and breaking down waste products, which can actually help reduce a lot of the waste and rubbish we have in the world, including some that can break down plastics, which is pretty damn impressive. 
Plenty of fungi help plants germinate and grow like orchids. Orchids could not exist without fungi's help. And of course, there's plenty of speculation and research being done into the psychedelic effects of some fungi and how that can help with certain mental health problems. Basically, fungi are fascinating and I am just a little bit in awe of them. And I'm so happy I've been able to kind of bring you on this little journey with me. Um, That said, I've not even scratched the surface on what there is to know about fungi in this video. I've literally just covered a few little you know, highlights here and there, hopefully try to whet your appetite and give you a little taster of why I love the world of fungi so much. But thank you for watching today, thank you for being with me on this little journey. Um, this was a weird one for me to film, I was very very uncomfortable filming outdoors but I kind of wanted to do it, I wanted to get out in nature and be like a part of it and be a part of the world and um, film some little bits outside and I'm, I'm glad that I did. I think it's helped kind of boost my confidence a little bit and it's, it's weird doing that stuff on your own and trying to set up shots and it's a little bit difficult and it's a warm day and I couldn't get any of the lighting right. There was a lot of things going on but I'm glad that I did it and if you like this kind of video then I can do it again and next time I'll get better and the next time after that I'll get better and better and better until I'm confident and I'm comfortable and we're creating some really awesome content, you know. I really want to go out this day and get some shots of fungi but sadly I just didn't manage to find any. Um, you know, luck wasn't on my side and uh, the, 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 maybe the weather wasn't right, maybe the season isn't right. Um, normally I at least see some kinds when I go out, but today, just sadly, wasn't quite my day. But I did get some gorgeous shots of the forest. Um, I did have a lovely little day out, just being out in nature and I sat down and I had a little paint for a while, which I loved. I'm not hugely happy with this painting, it's not my favourite, but you know, again, it's all part of the learning experience, isn't it? So, thank you for coming on this little journey with me today. If you want to check out any of the books I mentioned, I'll link them down in the description below, and there will be affiliate links. So if you want to um, buy these books or anything using those links, I get a couple of little, like, pens back towards my channel and helping me. It's not a lot, but it all adds up and it all helps. And you never know, if a few of you buy the book, I can go on and buy another book probably and talk about that. So, it, you know, every little helps, it's all good. But thank you for watching today. I appreciate you guys so much. And I will see you again very, very soon. Thanks a lot.